Um, so next session, we have Lucas, who is the CEO of Loft Labs, and also Brandon from CoreWiv. Um, yes. All right, is that good? Okay. Hi, yeah, so yeah, I'm just an engineer. This is Lucas, <laughs> he's more important than me. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I'm Brandon, um, and this is Lucas. We're here to talk about how we power AI labs, how we do inference, how we do training uh, at CoreWeave. Um, so yeah, so to introduce myself, I'm an infrastructure architect. I've been at CoreWeave for almost two years. Uh, been from basically the start to where we are now, um, and we've done a lot of changes along the way, and we'll kind of talk about that today with kind of how we do things now. Yeah, and I'm Lucas, I'm the CEO of uh, Loft Labs. Um, I got the company started about three years ago uh, from now and involved with different open source projects. We got vCluster started, we got DevSpace started, contributed that as a sandbox project to the CNCF. And uh, we recently launched another project uh, called DevPod, but today it's all about vCluster. Yeah. So for, I'm sure maybe some of you know who CoreWeave is. Um, for those that don't, this is the only sales pitch that anybody probably needs. CoreWeave is a specialized cloud for uh, purpose-built for GPU accelerated workloads on top of bare metal infrastructure. We don't, do v uh, we don't do hypervisor layers at all. You access the GPUs directly, um, and we allow people to scale from zero to whatever they need in a matter of minutes. And that's what we're built for, um, purely GPU-based workloads. So kind of how do we serve AI ML, um, just to kind of give you a basic rundown, is we don't have a hypervisor layer. We run on bare metal, Kubernetes K8s on bare metal. Um, we do support Kubert for VMs, uh, virtual machines on top. So for people who do need that, we do support that. Um, we have extremely fast responsive auto scaling for our inference thanks to a, a Knative stack that we run, um, which seems to do really well. And there's also some more talks about that this week. We have some of our team uh, contributing to that as well if you'd like to learn more. Um, and our stack is GPU optimized. Everything that the, you need to run GPU workloads is managed by us, the drivers. Uh, the health checks, um, all that stuff. So you just come with your applications, download your model weights, and you're good to go. And we're open source friendly. Everything we do is basically represented at KubeCon. Everything we run, you don't have to learn anything new. You can just, you know, you can ask questions. We're very responsive. We're very friendly to the environment. So it's, it's, there's no proprietary stack here. Um, and I do want to note the Tensorizer, which is a really uh, incredible open source concept. Like we're going to open source that soon. Um, it allows us to basically stream models directly into the GPU memory. Um, and actually, Wes Brown in the front here is one of the lead engineers on that, and he'll be happy to talk more about that this week if you're interested, so come by our booth um, to learn about that. But yeah, so it's just Kubernetes. It's really simple, we love Kubernetes. Plug. Um, yeah, so I have just two little demos um, just to kind of showcase what we're gonna talk about. The key word here being Catalyst. Catalyst is what we're calling our, our next generation of how we're gonna support customers, large and small, um, giving people the same experience. So hopefully we can see this. But. So what this is representing is we've worked with Loft Labs with you know, virtual clusters and kind of customizing that experience that allows people to deploy their own full cluster experience without needing to actually provision nodes, right? That was kind of what the power of vCluster gave people. Um, so we take it a step further and we basically Either we give you the same experience whether you don't want to buy nodes and pay for nodes, or if you need a dedicated isolated environment, we control the control plane the exact same. So all this demo is doing is showing you how, how quickly we can spin up about 25 completely um, compliant Kubernetes control planes uh, in our environment. Uh, we use a lot of custom, we use a lot of operators. We lose, use a lot of custom stuff. But so overall, it's nothing fancy, but it kind of gives you the idea of like, we can deploy clusters pretty, pretty quickly. Um, this is about two minutes to get the first one or two ready. Um, yeah, it's basically that, at least. Yeah, so we run, so we run etcd. We have a custom um, operator for etcd. Uh, we, we deploy the API server, the scheduler, uh, custom components that are required. And this is basically what would start your experience on, on CoreWeave, basically. And then the more fun one, I think, you guys are more interested in is we go to the next slide. Is we have a quick little um, Knative LLM demo for the Mistral 7B, um, which was actually an open sourced, uh, it's an open source model that was actually trained on CoreWeave. Um, Seven billion parameters, about 14 gigs in size, and it's actually pretty awesome. So this, this one's just a real quick demo of basically taking one of those clusters I just provisioned. Um, I went ahead and pre-installed Cert Manager, Knative, the, 
you know, the, the small things you need. Um, as you can see, we're running our RTX A5000s um, with min replica set to five. And as it goes to deploy, you'll see on the bottom, that's the remote cluster that I'll talk about in a second. And the top of the screen, you'll see the revision and the pods coming up. This is gonna take about 60 seconds because we're not using our accelerated object cache, but it takes about 60 seconds for the models to actually go ready for inference, um, which is not bad. But with our accelerated object cache and our tensorizer product, we can load about a 20 gig model, about 12 to 15 seconds um, to get your inference pods up and running. And that is confirmed. You can talk to us this week about it. So we'll just skip ahead. So once they're ready, you can see the revision has become ready, and then we're gonna go and do an inference request. Voila, so in a matter of one to two minutes, you've got your inference up, um, it's gonna scale to zero, you can scale up as, as much capacity as we have, um, and you didn't have to provision any nodes, you didn't have to do anything, you just come with your application, come with your weights, come with everything you need, and you're good to go. So that's kind of like really the power of what we're trying to present today in this environment is just, you can really do whatever you want and you don't have to care about any of the boring stuff. Unless you want to, then of course you can. But so, so to give some context, Catalyst is just CoreWeave's iteration of a Kubernetes control plane enhancement. Gives you full custom, customizability. Um, you, can, you can keep it virtual, you can keep it where you don't care, or you can go bare metal. You can get a full set of like 100 nodes. You can get SSH access, you get full network isolation thanks to the NVIDIA Bluefield DPUs and a bunch of stuff like that. So. Those are kind of the two offerings we have, and then we also combine them together that I'll talk about. And on the right, you'll see, or on the, yeah, on the right, you'll see we make use of a lot of uh, CRDs. We've got a couple that represent clusters and control planes, um, which just fancy way of saying, like, what's your IP space? You know, how many API servers do you want? Like, what's your etcd backend look like? And pretty boring, but you do this, that's all you need to do. That's all you need to deploy, it's very simple. And this allows us to do things like training clusters, inference workloads, CPU, you know, extensive CPU compute jobs, Spark jobs, it doesn't matter, you can do anything. So we like Kubernetes. We run Kubernetes in Kubernetes, everything's Kubernetes. I know it's like, like a meme at this point, but like it makes things simple because everything's Kubernetes. So, so to give you some kind of context, like we've kind of re-architected our, you know, our infrastructure because we do run on bare metal, right? We have no hypervisor, so it's a little bit different. So, we, we kind of, we run an internal cluster of eight nodes, you know, etcd on-prem. On-prem Kubernetes has always kind of been a pain because you have to manage it, it's not ideal. But running Kubernetes on Kubernetes is nicer because then you get to use the power of Kubernetes to manage things. So you're like, this is awesome, let's do that. So we have a, a bare cluster that kind of stands up like our day zero provisioning and then we have a, a set of other clusters on top. And the real power of this new framework is kind of in the top box here, right? So. As a customer on CoreWeave, you'll get, this, you'll get your own control plane that's deployed into basically a namespace, and then, oh, that's the wrong way. And then it'll connect to what we call these, these real clusters, right? So th these worker clusters are the ones that have 1,000 GPUs, 2,000 GPUs, 3,000 GPUs. Uh, today our cluster has 5,400 GPUs, or sorry, 5,400 nodes. I think it's like 30,000, 40,000 GPUs, I believe. Um, something like that, I could be wrong. But basically, um, each customer gets their own isolated control plane, thanks to um, the v Cluster Pro's distribution to be able to synchronize to that. And then you get isolation and you get to deploy as many GP workloads as you want. Um, the other thing that's cool though is that in this environment, you can also do a bare metal cluster. Like we can give you a real thing um, or syncing if you want and then you can switch. Like we can do that for you if you decide one day. You get funding and you want real nodes, sure. Pretty cool. So yeah, it's a lot of operators. Um, we like Kubernetes, so we do a lot of that stuff. Um, we use KubeBuilder. Um, we use Argo CD extensively under the hood for day two operations and management. We love GitOps. Um, and that's kind of one of the cool things that we do here is like we're very in line with like what's the industry standard. So when people come to us, we're very in tune with our customers of like how should we do things, how do we do it, and it makes it really easy for us to kind of communicate and get people started off the ground. And then one of the best things about this flexible deployment model is that vCluster Pro allows us to power our, our burstable on-demand environment that I discussed. But everything between that and like a true Kubernetes cluster is, is identical, right? So in terms of what we provision and what we give to you, it's the same. The only difference is what you tell us you need. So that makes it like really powerful that we don't have to build two stacks, it's one stack. 
And some of the other key things, it's like, it's really flexible. Um, certificates via Cert Manager, auto scaling via Prometheus. Um, we have a custom etcd CRD. We have network isolation from the Bluefield DBUs, as well as, you know, currently we're running Caligo, so we get to use, C you know, our network policies. So it's, a, it's pretty great, because everything's open source. We, you know, we're in the community, um, and it just works. And then finally, probably one of the more cool, cool things is um, we also have a lot of things specific for GPU um, style management of the nodes. We have uh, a really extensive HPC verification workflow framework that's based on Argo workflows for ensuring that things like the H100s and A100s are healthy. Um, there's a lot of burn-in tests you need to run. Like, you need to make sure that they're actually performing, um, especially with new systems. So we take care of all that for you and make sure that that works. Uh, the two other cool things that I mentioned was the accelerated object caches. Um, we have regional co-located object caches that can increase your model download times um, that I kind of hinted at. So that, is, that comes standard and we can integrate that into your inference services. And then um, we're gonna be open sourcing a Slurm on Kubernetes, which is basically called Sunk. Um, and that also is coming out, I think, Q1. But basically it's, we can run Slurm on Kubernetes and it's, it's really nice. So it's really cool. And then now I'll kind of hand it over to Lucas to talk about like how does the syncing actually work. Yeah, let's live, dive a little bit under the hood. And uh, you know, it's really great to have a cloud provider like Corviv here be so open about their internal workings, right? Uh, you rarely find that you know folks go out and actually tell you how their cloud is built up. Um, and we're diving a little bit deeper today. Um, so what Corviv is using uh, internally is a project called vCluster. We got vCluster started in 2021. Um, it essentially allows you to create virtual Kubernetes clusters. In fact, it's the only certified Kubernetes distro for creating virtual Kubernetes clusters. Um, we've seen over 40 million virtual clusters created. In the first 12 months that we launched the project, there were only a million virtual clusters around. Now it's two and a half years later and we just celebrated 40 million virtual clusters created. It's really, really exciting. Um, you'll see down here the, the GitHub link if you ever wanna uh, check it out yourself. You'll also find it at vcluster.com. Um, there's about 3,500 people who start the project, so definitely make sure you uh, check it out if this is, this is for you. What does vCluster do at its core? It essentially allows you to create secure multi-tenancy for Kubernetes. Um, and I don't envy you in having to translate it into sign language. That sounds really complicated. <laughs> um, essentially, when you're looking at Kubernetes clusters today, right, um, you have a lot of replication, right? Each one of these clusters has like cert manager, policy agent, Istio, Vault, right? All of these different components, right? And a lot of enterprises today um, are essentially spinning up Kubernetes cluster after Kubernetes cluster. Um, some of our customers, they come to us uh, and tell us we have 500 Kubernetes clusters, we have 1,500 Kubernetes clusters, we have 3,000 Kubernetes clusters, right? Just because every time somebody needs a cluster, you know, AWS told us spin up a new EKS cluster and that's what we did and handed it out to our engineers, right? Initially, they all look nice and uniform and over time, they really don't, right? Um, and then this becomes a whole mess. Um, we've identified this problem and we essentially created vCluster to solve it. vCluster allows you to create multi-tenant clusters. That means you have one cluster that runs your platform stack. So you run Cert Manager, OPA, et cetera, in one cluster. And then instead of handing out namespaces, which would be you know, the default multi-tenancy way in Kubernetes, instead you're launching these V clusters. And a V cluster is nothing else than a pod that runs a Kubernetes control plane, and then you can make that available via load balancer, ingress, et cetera, right? So people talk to this control plane now rather than the real clusters control plane. And that essentially virtualizes Kubernetes and allows you to use the underlying platform stack across these virtual clusters, right? So there's a lot of sharing that's possible. When we're looking at the standard V cluster, it runs virtual cluster workloads, the tenant workloads inside the V cluster and the control plane alongside each other in one namespace in the same Kubernetes cluster. That's the default. The underlying cluster we typically call host cluster. What CoreWave does though is a little bit different because obviously as a cloud provider, they're very advanced users, as you can tell from Brandon, right? Um, and what they're doing is this here, right? I'm not sure if you saw that, so I'll go back and do it again. So essentially, they run a control plane only inside one Kubernetes cluster, inside the multi-tenant cluster, and then um, we call that isolated control plane. That means the workloads that you're scheduling on these Kubernetes clusters, they may not be in that same cluster, they may be somewhere different, but the control plane is essentially in the same Kubernetes cluster, right? 
Um, and that's a really advanced feature. That's something that we have in our commercial distro. It's called vCluster Pro. It's essentially open source vCluster, but packages um, some advanced features like this isolated control plane um, into a new distro. Um, and why are they doing that? Essentially, security and resilience, right? If you um, have a faulty workload running, right, or you have a malicious user, they could try to attack your control plane, but if the control plane runs in a separate cluster, that attack vector gets a lot smaller, right? So it's easier to ensure SLAs for the control plane, which obviously as a cloud provider you wanna do. Um, and it allows also advanced workload topologies. That means you can sync the workloads to different um, locations. It doesn't have to be the same cluster. What does that mean? We'll take a look at how Core Week does this. There's essentially two deployment options they have for their customers, and Brandon was alluding at this uh, earlier, so um, let's take a look, uh, let's take a closer look at this. The option one is shared workload clusters. This is closest to the standard V cluster, where you are sharing the resources of the underlying cluster, with the exception that CoreWeave is actually using a separate cluster for this. Again, isolated control plane, we have one cluster running all of our control planes, the V cluster control planes, and then we have another cluster that runs our workloads. Um, and that happens via so-called synker. I'll dive into that in a second in what actually does that mean, syncing uh, workloads to another cluster. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, it means that we start workloads in a different cluster than we're currently in. Um, nodes in a vCluster is a very interesting question, so I front-loaded this, because every time I give a talk about vCluster, it's the first question that comes up. How do I see nodes? What is it when I run kubectl? I get nodes, right? And the answer is like everything uh, in IT, it depends, right? Um, there's multiple options that you can configure in vCluster. You can configure it to see all the nodes in that connected cluster. So in that shared workload cluster, we could expose all the nodes to the vCluster. Um, we could choose to show some nodes via uh, node selectors, for example. Um, we could also join dedicated nodes, which is something really interesting. Um, and we could also change the level of node visibility. So depending on which nodes we're syncing, we can, we can either say, give me the full copy of the node and expose everything to the user, um, which may not be something that a cloud provider like Core Weave wants, so they're actually using the second option here, modification. That means you can remove metadata, you can alter metadata, you can add additional labels, right? That means you may have some internal logic on, on, in terms of tagging and labeling your, um, your nodes and you don't wanna expose them to the customer, so inside the vCluster, uh, the tenants don't see that, but outside the nodes actually have these labels. And then there's the last step here, we can also fully obfuscate any nodes. That essentially means uh, we rename them, we change all the data, right? We make it look really different uh, than the actual node would look. That's the standard options. All of this works in standard vCluster. Um, and then the second option that Core Weave provides for folks, um, as Brandon said, if you have funding and you have the money to get your dedicated GPU nodes at Core Weave, really excited, um, then you can also schedule workloads to dedicated nodes. So we're seeing here one option is syncing, that's a default in vCluster, and then we also have the regular scheduling mechanism in Kubernetes to schedule things on a node. That also means we obviously have to join that node into that um, Kubernetes cluster, into that virtual cluster, and then it's really dedicated to that virtual cluster. Um, what does syncing mean? Uh, how does it work um, under the hood? So essentially, if we take a real Kubernetes cluster, right, you would talk as an admin to that API server, and then there's an etcd, a controller manager, a scheduler behind it, regular Kubernetes control plane, that creates a kube context for me, right? So I have a context, there's nothing in there, I have a pretty plain cluster, I can create a namespace. I could hand that namespace out to, uh, out to one of my teams now, but instead, what I'm doing um, is I'm using virtualization, I'm deploying a vCluster. And a vCluster is nothing else than a pod running in that namespace. Um, inside that pod, we have an API server, a data store, a controller manager, and a syncer, which is essentially our equivalent to a regular scheduler, right, that allows you to sync workloads to other clusters or to the underlying same cluster, um, rather than having it scheduled. So the vCluster doesn't necessarily need to know the nodes, right, which is a really interesting concept in terms of how to share and allocate resources in a very flexible manner. Um, but we can essentially see this is a separate control plane running as a pod. And we can now have our tenants talk to this API server instead of the real API server. That means the tenants have another kube context. That means the vCluster pod and the real namespace that we created down there, they don't see. That means the Istio, the Opera, anything we're running in the underlying cluster, they don't see, they can't touch it. We can make things available to them by exposing CRDs and enabling sync for CRDs. So for example, if we're saying, hey, we have a shared ingress controller and we want it, want it available for all of our tenants or for just some of the vClusters, 
we can essentially enable syncing for ingress, um, but by default, we actually just sync uh, parts under the hood. Um, how that looks is if I'm now creating, uh, if I'm talking as a tenant to my API server here and I'm creating a namespace, that's an entry in my data store, right? And you can see we support multiple data stores, etcd, SQLite, we have an embedded etcd option um, that is gonna come out, really, really uh, nice feature coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, and essentially, when we create that namespace, it doesn't exist in the underlying cluster. It's only virtual, it only exists in that virtual cluster's data store. We can now create CRDs and have operators running in that virtual cluster. Those CRDs won't exist in the underlying cluster. So a lot of autonomy for these tenants inside the vCluster, you can make them cluster admin, which is something that Core Weave obviously wants their uh, tenants to be for full flexibility. And then you obviously can create a deployment, just another entry in our data store, and then our controller manager sees, okay, replica number is one, I'm gonna create a pod for this, right? And then that pod needs to be scheduled. And typically you need a scheduler for this, and the scheduler needs to be aware of all your pods, and that actually creates a lot of that problem in Kubernetes of like managing that and essentially having workloads distributed, multi-tenancy making, making this really hard. So what we essentially have is a syncer, and the syncer copies the pod from the virtual context to the underlying cluster's context or to a different cluster's context, as in the case of the isolated control plane that Core is using. And the really cool thing about this is we actually certified Kubernetes distro. So we went through all the compliance check from the CNCF, right? We run them with every new version of vCluster. So you can be sure if you're using a vCluster or a real cluster, you won't be really able to tell the difference. Sometimes we see companies actually switch to handing out virtual clusters and then their tenants don't even realize that change, that they don't get an EKS cluster anymore, that they actually get a virtual cluster now. And then vCluster Pro, our commercial solution on top, besides what we talked about with the isolated control plane, also offers this really nice UI that you can check out. There's a free tier available for it as well. Um, there's lifecycle management for virtual clusters baked in, so you have some CRDs and a controller for managing virtual clusters. Um, you have templating capabilities and what we call apps. So essentially, uh, what Core Weave and others can do is define what should run in each virtual cluster. There may be certain components you wanna run in each virtual cluster and manage the life cycle of it. You can do that with this templating mechanism. You can manage and upgrade. It's kind of like an EKS, but you're running it yourself, right? Um, to essentially manage these virtual clusters. And then you can um, monitor virtual clusters. There's cost optimization baked in. One of the biggest features is sleep mode where you can actually say, hey, if there's no traffic coming into that virtual cluster for 20 minutes, turn it off, schedule it down, right? Then all the pods are gone, all the workloads are gone, you're saving a ton of money if you can uh, you know, reallocate these nodes or you can um, you know, auto-scale your clusters if you're in a public cloud or with uh, folks like CoreWeave. Um, and then you can also use this dashboard as like a you know, admin access for internal teams, support tickets, uh, folks debugging virtual clusters, um, and everything they do is uh, hooked up to your SSO, there's audit logging in place, right? So you have a consistent log of what everybody's running, any kubectl commands in any of these virtual uh, clusters. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, so kind of what's next for this? So 2024 is gonna be a busy year for us. Basically, uh, we talked about option one and option two. You got virtual on demand, kind of like what Corv does today, like you pay for just the GPUs, you don't have to reserve nodes. We also have the isolated environments if you need, uh, I don't know, if you need 10,000 GPUs, you can get that. Um, but in the future, we're gonna combine those. We are working on a hybrid environment that allows you to have a dedicated um, bare metal environment, but also be able to schedule to that on-demand burst environment through the use of the, deep, uh, the DPUs and you know, VPC stitching and a lot of really cool networking technology that's gonna be coming out next year uh, through a custom CNI. Um, so that's kind of really what's on the track for us is was, w w what we're aiming for is giving you a single interface into anything you need, whether it's an isolated environment, whether it's a shared environment, um, you should be able to do everything you want in one cluster and that's kind of what we're aiming for um, with this setup. So you can have a training cluster, you can also spin up inference workloads, you can also spin up one off like Redis clusters or whatever you guys need for any developers who need something random and you don't have to buy the nodes for that. So that's kind of what we're aiming for, and that's kind of what's coming next for us. Um, uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, these are our booths if you want to swing by and talk to us. Also, this is posted online if you want to check out Tensorizer for uh, faster model loading. There's also a getting started on Core Weave if you're curious about you know, some of the inference examples or the ML examples we have, and then obviously vCluster as well as up here uh, to check out, so thank you. <laughs>
Thank you.